Fisher in the Alamac Manta just cannot shake off his great rival and his lead could evaporate with a simple puncture. With this kind of pressure from behind, Bertie is really trying. The Sydney Meek prepared car has run faultlessly and with Fisher's bogey stage Fanet now finally behind him, his first stunning all victory is looking more possible by the mile. Crunching Gears, Season 2, Episode 1, Part 3. This is the third and final part of our tribute to Bertie Fisher. In this episode, I speak with Rory Kennedy, Alistair Fisher, and first of all, Dave Campion. Dave, at the time, worked at ProDrive, and he tells us about his, how the relationship developed between Bertie and himself. It's a fascinating sto story. I started off by asking Dave, how you first got to know Bertie? He approached us about the sale of an M3. Mm -hmm. We uh, were delighted to think about sending M3s to Ireland or anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And we, we managed to do a deal on the basis that he didn't want it left-hand drive, he wanted it right-hand drive. Okay. So we looked into it and we thought, yeah, that can be done. Mm -hmm. Then we looked into the regulations to make sure that it could be done legally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was okay. So we built two cars eventually, one for Bertie and one for Austin McHale. Mm -hmm. And then I started to get bad vibes from across the water okay. when the cars were entered for the Circuit of Ireland, mm -hmm. uh, that they weren't going to be allowed to start because the cars were illegal. Okay. And I tracked, it, tracked the rumours down. They were coming from the scrutineering area. So I thought, okay. So I decided to go to the event a few days early Turned up, got hold of the clerk of the course, can't remember who it was at the time, and said, are these cars going to be allowed to start on this legality issue or not? Oh, we start, we'll sort it out at the finish. And I said, well, not really, because if somebody's going to turn around to me at the end and say these cars are illegal, I wouldn't consider that to be a sporting gesture, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I don't know. I said, look, get off the fence, make up your mind. Are these cars, as far as your scrutineering team is concerned, legal or illegal? We've got two cars here, open to any inspection. Well, they're not, says scrutineer. Uh -huh. So I asked him to check. Yeah. Paragraph this, page that. Mm -hmm. And I said, can you tell me where they don't comply? Well, they don't manufacture an M3 right-hand drive. I said, that's very true. They don't. But they don't have to be manufactured right-hand drive. The regulations say we can flip them mm -hmm. as long as we use genuine BMW parts to do it. And we have. Yeah. Uh, well, we're not sure. I said, well... I'm going to suggest to my two customers that they get an assurance from you that you will pass them as legal when they win the rally. <laughs> <laughs> I was then being more than a bit pompous and a bit, yeah. <laughs> and I said, and if you 
want to challenge the legality, will you please do it now? Because I've got a lawyer sat in uh, UK who can be here within an hour or so. I can get him shipped over by helicopter and we can thrash it out. Mm -hmm. You tell me they're not legal, we won't start. Okay. We started. <laughs> and, yes. Things moved on from there, but um, Bertie was reassured, as was Austin, that two totally different characters. Mm -hmm. Bertie went about it like a businessman. Austin went about it emotionally. Okay. But yeah. we came to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. We went, we did, we did whatever we needed to do, and we were fine. Yeah. And that was my first introduction to Bertie in a tight spot, if you like. Mm -hmm. When he wanted to do the deal, he dealt, dealt with it like a proper businessman. What can I have? What will I get? What will it cost? Yes or no? And that was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. set the tone for the rest of our relationship from a business point of view yeah and and were you aware of Bertie before this like obviously you know with your previous positions and that you'd been in Ireland before had you i had been in everybody knew Bertie because mm -hmm. he was one of the top line boys in Ireland yeah. and it's like I'm aware that most of the time uh in my times he was run with Sydney, um, and we we um, we knew each other as competitors, but no more. No more uh, I I hadn't gone out to seek Bertie or anybody else for that matter, mm -hmm. but uh, was obviously more than happy to receive them when they approached us. Yeah. I, and like the, the M3 at that time, you know, was the car to have an Irish tower like between Bertie and Austin, they won a good view, good few events. And, the, you know, and the car is still iconic to this day. You know, people still love <laughs> that, that noise, don't they, you know? So. Well, the, that noise is responsible for my tinnitus and bad hearing. <laughs> So, uh, yes, I mean, they are, they're an iconic car. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, what can you say? M3 is an M3. Yeah. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a classic, it's a classic, classic motor car, really. Yeah, and yeah. then, then Bertie went away from a year, but he came back again then with the, the promise of a legacy. Again, an, an all groundbreaking car too, can it come along at the start, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, a couple of people approached us about legacies mm -hmm. and uh, Bertie asked if he could have one. And I said, yeah. Um, in truth, the first person, person to have one was um, Kenny McKinstry. Mm -hmm. He was the first one to put his money down. But we did a deal for a legacy. Um, at the time, we then got a customer division almost okay. where we took rally cars from the rally team, world rally team, mm -hmm. lock, stock, and barrel. And then we we rebuilt them into as new cars, right. not necessarily with all new parts, mm -hmm. but all everything about the whole car was rebuilt from the ground up. And we used to strip the cars, rejig the bodies, strip them off, paint them, blah, 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 mm -hmm. and they were like a new car. You, It was difficult to recognize them as not being a new car as you walk around them. Yes. And uh, by that time, we made a better job of sorting the suspension out initially with the legacies, mm -hmm. a much better job than we did with the M3. The first 
trip out in an M3 in Ireland yeah. was and well. <laughs> bloody disaster. Yeah. But we got, up, we got over it. We sorted ourselves out. Legacy was pretty good. We, yeah, and the legacy went well. And, yeah, uh, as is obvious, we, we sold a few over there. Mm-hmm. In a relatively short space of time, but yeah, again, it, Bertie's tactics with me, uh, he'd ring up, can I come and see you? Yeah, what's available? What can I have? You tell him, okay, upgrades as they become available. Yeah, uh, and if you like, a lot of people respected Bertie, Mm -hmm. both as a person, as a businessman, as a rally driver. And I was beginning to get a very comfortable feeling with him Mm -hmm. that, okay, we can do this, we can do that. He was very loyal. He said, can you service it? And at that time, we could, but I was a bit reluctant to. I didn't want to stretch myself of the company too far. Mm-hmm. He said, I said, why do you ask? He said, well, I want to keep a relationship with Sydney Meek. Sydney supported me, looked after me for many years. I'd like him to be involved on the ground. I said, well, I don't have a problem with that. I've got a lot of respect for Sydney Meek. I know quite a few of the boys that work for him. And yeah, I don't have a problem with that. He said, but we need your engineer. I said, that's fine. And that was just the mark of the man. Mm-hmm. Everybody else took the cars away. Yes. We we're wrong. Yes. Okay. Rally people, race people, they're all the same. They all think they can do better than you. The fact that we've invested millions in these bloody cars. Yes. We can do better. Fine. Mm -hmm. I don't have a big issue with that. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do it. I've got the full backing of all the engineers that designed, developed, ran the cars. And, you know, this is part of my sales spiel, if that's what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Bertie understood that quite quickly. And he said, okay, so we'll use one of your engineers. And um, yeah, fine. And because he was successful and because people saw us with some of our people on the ground, they thought it was getting special treatment. And it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was part of the deal. Yes, that's this the, that's is what, that was the deal he wanted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is what it's going to cost you, Mr. Fisher. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Campion. That's a bit expensive. What do I knock off to make it less expensive? Mm -hmm. It wasn't a matter of, will you keep delivering that and knock the price down? He understood that I was trying to do a very keen deal Mm -hmm. because by that time, it was good business for us. Mm-hmm. And so that's how it went on. And a lot of people said, oh, well, of course, Bertie gets upgrades before anybody else gets them. That's not true. Never was true. Right up until the very last car we ran with Bertie, mm-hmm. whatever Bertie had, if somebody had walked through the door two seconds before or two seconds after, they could have had the same deal. Yes. And yeah. He was he was paying good money for a good service, mm-hmm. but that's me talking. Yeah. If he was around, it would be up to him to say. Yeah, but whether uh, that, was, that was successful. But, yeah, you can't argue with the fact that it was successful. successful. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what can you say? It worked. Yeah. And like, you know, we think now like the we started off with the legacies into the impresses and like right up through all the world rally cars. The amount of Subaru yeah. World Rally cars and Subaru Rally cars that come to Ireland and were, you know, yeah. running rallies. Like Bertie and was one of the initial 
building blocks of that success, really, isn't he? Right, you know? well, he certainly was. And, you know, he... Um, he was the first to get on the pro-drive bandwagon, if you like. Mm -hmm. And he did leave us once um, because he came, asked me for a deal to do this, this and this. Gave it to him. He said, it's too expensive. I can't justify spending that sort of money. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. What do you want to knock off? He says, I'm not prepared to knock anything off. But I understand where you stand. I understand where you stood. He said, and he went off to RED and ran a Ford. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't lose contact. Um, if we were around, we'd always speak. Mm -hmm. And he just rang me one day and he said, uh, can I come and see you? I said, yeah. He said, um, I'm not happy with the Ford. Can't get on with it. Um, can you do me Subaru again? And I said, probably. <laughs> and we thrashed a deal out. And he finished with the Ford and he came back to us. But there was absolutely no side issues with that at all. Mm -hmm. There was, I didn't operate any different. He didn't operate any different. Yes. Can I do this? Yes. Can I do that? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we thrashed it out. And then, of course, we, um, as we moved into Impressors, this is the only time that you need, that Bertie did something unique. Mm -hmm. He wanted mm -hmm. one of the last Group A impressors. Yes. Um, the emolligation on the last Group A impressors was fairly comprehensive, to say the least. Mm -hmm. Some of it was brilliant. Some of it was not so brilliant. In that it was difficult to keep it all on song. Okay. We were getting to the world rally cars, mm -hmm. and world rally cars are difficult without the right inputs to keep 100% on song. Okay. So we had a big meeting about what could and couldn't be done mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what spec of car we could deliver in terms of what was homologated, what did we need for Ireland, what we didn't need for Ireland. And some of our technical guys were part and parcel to that meeting. We broke that meeting up. Bertie went away. I went away. As he would put it, you better go away with a sharp pencil and see what you can come up with. <laughs> so we came up with a specker car, and then we had to build it to that spec to take advantage of some of the good things mm -hmm. but because it was to the correct spec some things on it never got used okay and did a deal with him and this is where he was unique he is the only person and it was partly due to the opportunity at the time he was the only person we ever built a brand new car for. Right. It was built on a brand new shell. Uh -huh. The factory team was just going off uh, Group A onto World Rally Car. Mm -hmm. So we had a spare shell and we had a spare this and we had a spare that. And I had a good, because of course it was good business for ProDrive. I had a look around and I thought, bloody hell. If we're not careful, we could end up building a new car here. Mm -hmm. And that was good business for us because it got rid of a load of stuff that we 
as a company we're never going to use again. Yes. You know, yes. We could have sold it for sure. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, we might as well put it all in one spot and sell it as a big bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, that was a very successful car. Mm -hmm. But it it deserved to be. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It was it was a really nearly a nice motor. Yeah. But of course, by this time, uh, I'd got quite a relationship going with Bertie, I guess, mm -hmm. and his family. And at the time, in that period, I am lousy with dates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have difficulty remembering my own birthday, and that's this week. I'm <laughs> uh, but he, uh, he spent a lot of time in the UK, and he had got business in London and elsewhere. And he'd often ring me up, and I knew he was in the car. And he said, what are you doing this evening? I said, not a lot. How do you fancy going out to the pub for a bite to eat? Oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. That was a euphemism for, have you got a spare bed for the night? <laughs> My lady is a very, very sociable lady. Uh -huh. and she enjoys rally people. Yes. And of course, he used to spend more than the odd night mm -hmm. at my house. Yes. And that's where we more or less decided it was a thing between us that if we did business, it was in my office. Okay. Then we go home for supper. Right. Ultimately, right. my wife and I, Georgie and I, used to go to Ireland. Yes. Yeah. If we needed to talk business, we used to go into his office in Ballinamallat. Right. Not even his study at home. No. We used to go into the office. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a rule we made with one another. Yes. And it worked brilliantly. Okay. I don't know. Well, there was nobody else that we would have um, had that sort of arrangement with mm -hmm. because uh, the two families got on quite well together. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we used to have a really... Well, we spent... Millennium Night in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and had a few parties over there and we used to have a few long weekends there and yeah, it, it was a very yeah, it was a very sociable mm -hmm. uh, a relationship that meant a lot to Georgie and I Yeah, not only but Gladys, mm -hmm. Mark, Emma, Roy, all of them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a sad situation in which we now find ourselves. Yeah. And like your kids were the sort of right about the same age as Bertie's kids and that too. So there was there was a bond there. Yeah. That too, so. Yeah, there was. I mean, Georgie and Gladys used to do motorhomes for Bertie. Brilliant. Uh, in Ireland, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it was a relationship that worked extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, good memories, very good memories. So, like, yeah. you look back now, and you're you know, you're you think of Bertie Fisher, the rally driver, and then Bertie Fisher, the man. What is the, the standout memories? I think back. And the first thing I think of is Bertie Fisher, the man. Mm -hmm. To me, Bertie Fisher, the rally driver, is secondary. Okay. I've never met. I've only met one person that comes close to being the sort of man that he was. He... He never swayed from his basic values. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, 
I've been in his office. I've been around him when he has been working, mm -hmm. um, sort of waiting for him, waiting for him. And you can't help but pick up some of the vibrations that go mm -hmm. on around him. He also, was also unique that he knew how to go out and have a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Irish after rally parties are <laughs> known around the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Georgie managed to learn, as she calls it, the real world words to a lot of songs which he never understood before. <laughs> One of them had something to do with Alice, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She, she, she used to enjoy it every bit as much as me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but that that was the man mm -hmm. and the rally driver. Very competitive. Very hard. Uh, no stone left unturned. But always on the right side of the regulations, yes. the right side of what was the correct thing to do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. He only ever asked me for one favour, which, as luck would have it, killed about three birds with one stone. <laughs> do you remember the Millennium Rally he organised? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. In yeah. whoever's quarry. Uh, Quan's quarry, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. He said, um, basically, it was a charity event. Mm -hmm. He said, and I need, an, I need a name in a world rally car. Okay. What can you do for me? Mm -hmm. uh, don't know, but I'll try. And it's, as luck would have it, I'd been in the company of Anno Mikola. Yes. And we were both testing at the same place in Oxfordshire. Um, and he said, uh, can I try your group N car? I said, of course you can. Go and have a blast round. And he came back. He said, that's quite impressive. I've not driven a group N car before, but quite impressive. I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was there driving one of David Sutton's escorts. All right. Yeah. So he said, if ever I got the chance, I'd love to try a World Rally Car. I said, well, <laughs> I know it used to be one of my early boy heroes. Yes. So I said, I know if I can find one for you to drive, great. Uh -huh. And Bertie asked me this question. And all of a sudden, I was aware that I would be at a place of being invited to a function, which I knew Hannah would be at. Yes. So, rang him and said, you said to me once you'd like to drive a World Rally car. He said, yeah. I said, how do you fancy to go into Ireland to drive a World Rally car? Mm -hmm. Oh, don't know. So I explained. Bertie wanted a name and a car. Uh -huh. I happen to have a car. It's it's, it's about all the stars aligning, yes. if you like. Uh -huh. I happen to have a car in the workshop, which was just about to be stripped out for rebuild for us to sell. Okay. It had about, I don't know, 300 kilometers left on it, transmission, engine, etc. Okay. And I said to our boys, I said, could you refresh that enough for it to go to Ireland and do a short rally? Yeah, I suppose so. So I said, right. If I told you we were going to put Mr. Mickler in it just for a bit of fun, we could definitely do it. Uh -huh. So 
We begged, borrowed, scrounged a whole load of kit. <laughs> and I rang Bertie up and I said, right, we can do this. Hanno Mickler. Oh, my God. <laughs> In a world like Oh, my God. What's this going to cost me? And I said, well, if you're really lucky, hotel room and a boat fare. And he says, you blankety blank joke. Yes. <laughs> I said, very few times in your life that all these things come together at the right time yes. for the right reason. Uh -huh. And of course, we went. And I don't think David Richards knows to this day that we did that sort of a deal. Yeah. Never done it before, never done it since. Uh -huh. Never had the opportunity yeah. to do it before or since. It cost us a large amount of nothing. Uh -huh. We got insurance on the car. Bertie might well have paid that, but if he did, that was about all. It did Fisher's a lot of good. Mm -hmm. It did Pearl Drive a lot of good. Yeah. Had a, had a nice time. His only condition, thinking about it, his only condition was that he could pick the co-driver. Okay. So, I said, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Who are you going to pick? He said, my son. I said, has he got a license? He said, he will have. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, that's all right by me. Yeah. And so Bertie and son arrived. Uh-huh. They he was starting off very low key and casual. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, can we do a recce? I said, I think so. I'll see if Bertie's got a car you can borrow. Bloody hell, by the end of the day, it had gone from being very casual to very, very professional mm -hmm. and issuing instructions to son about pace notes. And oh my God. So I thought, what have I let myself in for yeah. here? <laughs> It worked very well. It worked extremely well. Uh -huh. And, yeah, it's fine. And, you know, a couple of the boys said to me, how did you pull that off? I said, I said, I didn't really. I said, it just sort of happened. Yeah, just more than um, good things that happened, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it is nice to be able to do things when you can. I mean, uh -huh. Bertie, by that time, had spent an awful lot of money with us. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to give him a little bit of payback, of course. Yeah. But, but I mean, there's other things happened that gave me some quiet pleasure, if you like. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we had Bertie and Mark both doing the RAC. Yes. And he rang up. He said, can you give me a price for running Mark on the RAC? I said, yeah. So I gave him a price. He said, yeah, okay, we'll do it. And then a couple of days later, I had another situation where I had a car <sighs> getting ready for rebuild for sale. I rang him up and I said, right, this is a deal for you. You do the RAC in a team with Mark. Can't afford it. I said, you'll be able to afford this deal because it's like what no other you'll ever get from me. <laughs> he said, well, you will do it. I said, well, A, it'll make me money. Two, it'll be very nice to see father and son out yeah. on the same event. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm telling you that you've got to afford it. <laughs> I mean, the relationship was very strong for them. Um, as we all know, we went and did it. Yeah. Um, which I'm very pleased that they did. Yeah, especially but, the way things well, turned out. It was lovely to have for them, wasn't it? You know. So. I mean, I'm a boring old fat by now. Um, and I'm old enough to have been around the block a few times. And people often ask me, you know, what about, how about, doing deals for this now about making business for that. I said, well, I'll hold you up a gentleman 
who knows how to do business properly. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say who it was, but it was Mr. Fisher. Mm -hmm. And they said, but, uh, well, you can't resist doing a deal. I said, no, you work out what you want to buy or what you want to sell. You do the keenest possible price to make sure you can sell it, but you don't give it away and you ensure you're making a profit. Mm -hmm. Equally, if you're buying, decide what you want, decide what you're prepared to pay, and if the two don't fit, don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether you're dealing in rally cars, yeah. in steel frame buildings, selling mm -hmm. fish, yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was perfect at that, but he was generous. Mm -hmm. So he used to look after people that nobody else knew. No, it was just done, and there was no talk about it, no mention of it. It was just done, and that was it, wasn't it? Yeah, so. mm -hmm. He would go and do it. Yeah. Done. Yeah. He was very passionate about being a. He was very passionate about being an Irishman. Mm -hmm. He was very proud of his business. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he and Ernie were the ones that turned it into what it was. Um, very proud family man. Um, I'm not trying, trying to make him sound perfect. Mm -hmm. But it was a very, very special man. Dave, I think there's a nice place to leave it, isn't it? So thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Not at all. Not at all. Pleasure. Very pleased to have done it. Is it true you've got a bit of a power advantage over Kenny in this time? No, not really. Kenny might want to think that all right, but uh, we have basically got a different exhaust system, which um, is um, straight through to the back of the car rather than coming out the side. We used to have a lot of problems with fumes inside the car uh, from the side exhaust, so we have a straight through exhaust system. And uh, we're also trying a different uh, chip in the management system. But um, it's hard, you know, I don't think it's any more, certainly no more horsepower anyway. Bertie's nephew, Alistair Fisher, joined us now in this segment. And I start off by asking Alistair, what is early memories of Bertie were? Um, I suppose really it's just you know, from sort of you know, growing up. Um, obviously, when the accident happened, I was was only 12 years of age. So, you know, so growing up, it was just sort of the family occasions and, um, you know, seeing them at, at the weekends. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe at, at a grand and, grand and Granny Fisher's house. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just sort of the get-togethers over the years. You know, I'm probably seeing you know, Uncle Bertie and, and Mark in the, you know, in the office down in Fisher Engineering. Just maybe whenever I'd have been in, in there after school or whatever, you know, during the week or course, yeah. or, or whatever. And yes. um, I suppose you know, going to the the events over the years with with dad, it would I wouldn't probably remember the early the early nineties. Would have it would have been more so the you know the the late nineties and mm -hmm. uh, probably the the blue and Pratt's would probably be my first real memories. Uh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. real memory L five five five, and then mm -hmm. onto the onto the silver tough Mac car. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, probably I would I would recall Mark in the in the Tough Mac Evo as well. Yes, but mm -hmm. you know, that's and, uh, the and early they really, memories, really. Yeah, and like you know, you're saying there, you did Did you just go to many events? Did you stop the lunch and run to the company? Maybe? I can remember, you know, oh, sort of going to the going to the Lake of the Circle of Ireland or the you know, the Ulster Rally. I can I can recall. Mm -hmm. you know, spectating on the Ulster Rally on some of the night stages. You know, of the Ulster Rally probably would have came quite close in them days, probably down to, you know, Ahar, Clahar, Five Mile Town sort of direction. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do remember being, you know, at the at the finish ramp for the Circuit of Ireland a few years. I recall the one in the, the Silver Tough Mac yard where Uncle Bertie won the event. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it was in 99, we, uh, I remember going down to the Galway Rally. It was 
sort of a typical Galway that I know now it was wet and wet and murky. <laughs> I, I can remember you know, coming up the road with, with dad in the car and there was a few other two other guys. Um, one of them was was Ian Cochran who, who still works for the business and uh, you know, just hearing the rally report on the radio as we came, came up the road. Mm-hmm. You know, and sort of the, the yes. memories that stand out really. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Rory won that weekend as well too, didn't he? Yeah, so, yeah I think you're right. I think, uh-huh. I think that is. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like, yourself, actually, you know, like, whenever you were growing up, was it always rallying or like, did you want to play for Liverpool or Man United? I have to say, you know, I was never really, I didn't really set out to, you know, to start driving. Um, you know, I would have played rugby at school and, and, and a bit of football. I was probably better at, at the rugby. Uh-huh. Um, and then sort of turned whatever it was, 16 or so, and we started doing the, the events at Nuts Corner. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And uh, I think when I, it, uh, I sort of didn't get as many, I sort of, I didn't get as many starts in the road between them because it sort of was away, uh, away at the notch corner on a Saturday, oh, and the, that was the end of the rugby. So <laughs> you know, from I'm from there, you know, dad, dad sat with me at notch corner at the start. Um, mm. We were out in a, in a Nova, and you know, even at that point in time, it was never a massive focus. But mm. I suppose turn turn seventeen got the license and. Uh, we built a we built a course and really so the results were, were pretty good in the in the mm-hmm. class and it sort of snowballed from there really. Yes. So it did. Mm-hmm. And like, now did you feel the pressure of carrying the pressure name at the start or was it something that you were aware of really? I felt probably the first the first year in the course really in the in the Northern Ireland Championship it was you know, it was very much new to me you know mm-hmm. I didn't really probably feel under pressure then but. Once we sort of jumped to the one make championship in the Fiesta STs, mm-hmm. you know, for the following couple of seasons, you know, the, the level sort of increased, and you know, I was head to head with you know, a lot of other sort of young and up and coming drivers that were starting out. And I suppose it was then that I probably started to put some pressure on myself to get results. And you know, thankfully, mm-hmm. the the came quite naturally without really having to sort of overthink things. and Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but look, there was always undoubtedly pressure, you know, to perform and and uh, you know try and be at the front. But that day, uh, it seemed to work out okay over the years. Mm-hmm. And you're you not know, the best person to answer this, but you know, like Bertie and Mark always seem to have that you know very strong mental attitude and very methodical, you know, work through everything, you know, get everything, to per, you know, all your preparation done before you get to the. Like, you seem to be very much of that as well. Is that something that you feel you inherited from the Fisher, uh, suppose, way of doing things? Okay, yeah, you know, I feel you, know, you have to prepare, and you know, I, would, I would put a lot of work into my PS notes, you know, mm-hmm. on the weekend off an event, and you know, leading up to it, uh, you know, Gordon would, Gordon and I would go out and you know, pick a back road somewhere and, you know, maybe one or two weeks before before the event and just go out and practice the notes and, you know, get your head into gear again. Um, you know, back in the World Championship days, you know, I took fitness very seriously and, mm-hmm. you know, preparing, being eating well, leading up to the event and so on. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things that, you know, Uncle Mark and Uncle Bertie would have put in place over the years mm-hmm. in the business. You can still see it you know, coming through and, and people that are in the business today, how they approach things and, you know, there, there's, there's a, you know, schedules and you know, the, the sort of the, the things Uncle Bertie would have put in place would, would still be in play really, you know, today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, I think as Rory said the other night, like Bertie was the kind of man who went into Fisher Engineer, he knew everybody's name from the, the, the highest down to the guy that was, you know, the, you know, the boy that was driving the forklift or whatever, he knew them personally been named and they were comfortable enough to you know call him Bertie and whatever. There was no, there was no airs or graces. Everybody worked oh, yeah. together. Yeah, that's it. I think um, you know, it was always sort of that that personal touch, and you know, as you, as you say, everybody knew Uncle Bertie, and and you know, Uncle Bertie and you you all the guys in the workshop floor, and uh, you know, that sort of. It just created that sort of strong working relationship, and you know the the guys would always go the extra mile for mm-hmm. Uncle Bertie, and then he knew you could rely on them, and you know, that shone through and the work they produced, and you know all the the contracts you know that the one over the years and delivered. Mm-hmm. 
So like then, now you're, you know, can you go to rallies? And look, it's still happening. As people still come up to you and talk about Bertie and Mark and all, do you still hear all the stories? I could certainly do. You know, when we we done the, the World Championship stuff, and it would just it would amaze you. You know, people coming up and you know, sort of European fans or spectators, and you know, asking the question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are you related to Bertie Fisher or whatever? Mm -hmm. And again, you know, whenever, whenever you, we'd have been doing the, the British Championship events and, you know, down in Cork and Clarney, he was very, very popular. You know, there's mm -hmm. always, always people down there mentioning him and mm -hmm. it was, it was great to see that. And um, it was it's nice to, to, to be able to talk about them and people, you know, hold, still hold them in such high regard. Yeah, like 20 years later, you know, he's still held in such high regard, you know, he's still a, a hero of the sport. That's it. You know, there's, there's probably barely a day goes by that you know somebody doesn't um you know maybe post something on social media or you know the sort of put up a memory or share a photograph and uh, it was really nice to see mm -hmm. um that sort of the eighties and nineties whenever Uncle Bertie was coming up through really they were they were the sort of golden years of rallying. Mm -hmm. You know, through the, the Mark IIs and into the Mantas and the BMs and the, the, the Subarus. Mm -hmm. you know, they were iconic cars. And I think yeah. that sort of sits with people and people remember them days, you know, very yeah. strongly. Uh, you, know, the, you know, you think of the BM, you think of Bertie Fisher, you think of the, the, the Subaru, the legacy, the first name that pops into your head is Bertie Fisher, isn't it really? You know, so, you know. No, that's it. And, you know, I think um, nothing. You know, for me, and I will ever replace the, you know, the sound of the the group A and Pratt's is on the stages, and yeah. I think that's the case mm -hmm. for a lot of people, really. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So we skip forward then, you know, to the Galway Rally in 2020, or we say this year, last year, and uh, your first out, right, won the top round of the Tarmac Championship, and the, you, you said after it, you were dedicated to Bertie's memory too, because it had been 21 years since he had won the rally. That must have been pretty special for yourself and Gordon. It certainly was at the time. Um, obviously, we've been trying for quite a few years to to, to get that one over, you know, to get a, a tarmac win over the line. We'd mm -hmm. probably the best part of a dozen second overalls, but in, in a way, it made it all the sweeter when when we won Galway back mm -hmm. this time last year now almost. So it uh, you know it was quite a quite a bit of emotion for me and you know for for Gordon and the whole family and you mm -hmm. know really. The, People have supported me over the years, and um, you know, there's a lot of people drop me messages after the event, and you know people people phoning me that I would never really have spoke to on the phone before. Sort of just yeah. people got my number off somebody and, and rang me. You know, uh -huh. sort of pe people from Uncle Bertie's era, and uh, you know, this Hugh O'Brien rang me and and John Lyons, and mm -hmm. just to congratulate me. And uh, it was it was nice nice for them guys to take the time out to do that. Uh, it was a lovely thing to do. And like at the finish of the, uh, at the finish line, your mum and dad was there, and Austin McGill too. You know that was very poignant for Austin and his wife Bertie to be there as well, wasn't it? It was. You know, Austin still you know uh, follows the the Tarmac Championship a lot, and you always see him on on the events there. And mm -hmm. at uh, you know we came up, and I think he might even give me a hug. To be honest, I can't just quite remember, <laughs> but he uh, he would just said well done, and yeah. It's it's funny that there's a photograph of I think of Gordon and I up on the 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 roof of the car, and you can see Austin standing in the background, sort of looking up at us. So mm -hmm. that's a funny. I seen that the other day there. I thought it was a a nice photograph, but yes, you know, obviously Austin had a lot of big battles with Uncle Bertie over the years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I'm sure I'm sure he can tell plenty of stories. But it mm -hmm. uh, you know it was it was a nice Sunday evening now uh, and got on Galway last February that's for sure that's for sure I, like I would say Bertie and I know Austin said to me like, from an interview like his toughest competitor throughout the years was Bertie and I'm sure like I'm sure the feeling was reciprocal too you know like they had some mighty battles over the years yeah, okay, yeah they certainly did um, I'm sure they didn't give each other um, much grace now on no. the stages but <laughs> you know I think Austin always made it pretty clear that they uh, you know Whenever they were at the bar after the event, or you know, socialising, that you know they uh, they just got on like sort of best friends, nearly. That mm -hmm. you know, but that's what it was all about. The I think the great camaraderie 
you know, all the drivers, you know, had back then. And mm-hmm. and for me, we, you know, even the, all the drivers of my generation, I feel we have good camaraderie, mm-hmm. you know, but obviously when the helmet goes on, it's a, it's a yes. different story. Every season counts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, just so we to wrap things up a little bit now, like, like, I've asked everybody this so far, like, your, your standout memory of your Uncle Bertie and then Uncle Bertie, the rally driver. I think really from a personal point of view, it would just be, you know, what sort of family get togethers. He was always uh just probably probably fun to be around, really. Um you know, just he was pretty cool, cool customer and uh you can that's, that's really it from a from a personal point of view. Mm-hmm. Um you know, we always knew that he has sort of had a presence. Yeah. About him, he, he even had just family events, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, what he was, he was down to earth, and and that was that really. Um, mm-hmm. I suppose from a from a motorsport point of view, it's just really you know, driving them practices and and uh, just probably the memories of like, the service areas, you know, when they could done all in Milford Mart or maybe he had a he had a town center service area somewhere you know just sort of vague memories in the yes uh-huh. somewhere in your head you know but mm-hmm. um that's uh and the big crowds obviously surround them even then you know so okay that's it you will recall i know it touched on earlier on but the finish ramp it was may have been in banger off the circuit of ireland and uh-huh. maybe 98 or 99 you know just uh-huh. the, the, the buzz that there would have been and Yes. You know, pulling up in the silver car and the, the crackles and the buyings and mm-hmm. and uh, Uncle Bertie and Rory up on the bonnet spraying the champagne. So yeah, it's pretty special. And like your uh, memory, that like your granny and granddad was there all too, wasn't it? You know, so like it was a real family occasion. Uh, it certainly was. Um, you know, Grand Fisher and, and Granny obviously were very proud of you know um, Uncle Bertie and Mark's achievements and them. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, as you say, they were they were the first ones up to congratulate him on on the ramp, and mm-hmm. and they uh, it was their memories live on, and it's, it was nice to see the clips of that now and again, and mm-hmm. and little photographs and stuff. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's there's out in, in my granny and granda's house, there's um there's there's photograph on the wall there of, of Uncle Bertie on it's just a photograph of him on the phone, and there's a little quote underneath it. Where he was calling back to Ballamallard to tell Grand Fisher he'd won the Circuit of Ireland for the first time. Right. So it still hangs in the wall out there. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's just way things like that that you remind you every now and again when you see them. Uh-huh. Pretty special. Well, Alistair, I think that's as nice a place maybe we'll just wrap it up with that. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. Cheers. Good man. And Bertie Fisher, navigated by Rory Kennedy, goes into the history books to become the greatest all-time Tarmac Championship rally man, with 18 wins to his credit since the Ulster Rally in 1981. Bertie, absolutely fabulous. You've broken all the records. 18 wins. Nobody's ever done that on Tarmac before here in Ireland. Yeah, Plumas, obviously we've had a superb weekend. You know, the um, rally's been really good. It's been very tough. It's been, um, you know, starting out on Friday. I don't think I was really that confident, but um, you know we got off to a very good start, and uh, I think we got a bit of a lead on the boys whenever they were uh, they weren't really re- waiting for it, you know. And uh, obviously it's worked out very well, and um, the car has been absolutely brilliant, just routine service and all the way through. So um, you know, 18 wins, it's, uh, and to do it at this event, it's it's probably makes it even the better, you know. Finally, we speak to Rory Kennedy. Rory started sitting with Bertie full time in 1990 and he sat with him right through to the year 2000. In this time, Bertie won 18 Tarmac Championship rallies, four titles. It's quite astounding. It was a lovely story. I'm sure you will enjoy it. I started off by asking Rory how you first got to know Bertie. Well, I, I met Bertie, um, first time I met Bertie, of course, I knew off Bertie long before I met him. Um, we used to go to Sydney Meeks workshop in Dungannon with uh, James McDade and Vincent Bonner and so on. And of course, Bertie's cars were always there, and Bertie's cars, uh, Bertie's cars were run by Sydney. And well, in fact, all the top cars, you won the car was capable of one. You had to go to Sydney Meek back then. Mm-hmm. So Bertie was always there, and on the rallies we met him, and 
always a bit of crack with him and he's ultra competitive and he always had a great demeanor about him. You know, he always was an example of how to do the thing and, you know, how to do the job correctly. Like, mm -hmm. and then once, then once um, he wanted to do a test in Donegal and he asked me, could he help out, you know, in putting it together, which I did do. And I did that quite a bit back in them days. But anyway, he came to Donegal and the, and the man to do a test and um, I got to sit with him. No, actually, it wasn't the Manta, I beg your pardon, it was this, the three door Sierra. Okay. So, whatever, 88 was it, maybe? Uh -huh. or there yeah. might say mm -hmm. that year. So, I got to sit home during the test for quite a bit. And, um, okay, great, great demeanor and great way of going about things and, and mm -hmm. doing things properly. And, uh, you know, it was somebody who you'd sort of um, look up to. And I was a, obviously a young co driver and trying to make my way as well. So, it was great to be able to mix with that, with that company and these sort of people, you know, because the end of the day, that helps you and raise your game as well, and you go along with it, like. Mm -hmm. So then, I uh, um, you partnered with them in '89 for Donegal and the Manx National Rally. Austin was able to was unable to yeah. do these two rallies. So, so the, yeah, a dream start for you. Oh, a dream start! My goodness, I you know what you know. Previously, we did the rally in '85, whatever in Calvin, uh -huh, just for yeah. pure chance, and uh -huh. how it all came about was incredible, and. Really, that set the seed because those are a few more things like the test I spoke of. Uh -huh. And then when Austin became unavailable for Donegal in 89, um, of course, I was available, absolutely. Uh, I was rallying with Vince at that time, Vince mm -hmm. Warner, who's a very good driver in his own right as well, a brilliant driver in his own right. But whenever the opportunity came up for with Verde, it was for Donegal initially, but decided at last minute we're going to go and do the Manx National Rally. Mm -hmm. I had done the Manx a few times. Richard Hall may have done it and we had done it in a Peugeot, and we had done it in a, in a Mazda as well. So I'd done the rally, I was quite familiar with it, and also that was good, that was very good to go and uh, did the Manx rally, uh, Manx National, first time out, M3 won the rally. Incredible to do again. Uh, so we had one in Cavan back whenever a few years before that, uh -huh. and we'd won again, so again, 100% record. <laughs> so it was off to a good start, really. So brilliant experience and so on. And then that led on to Donegal then the very next month. Mm -hmm. So big effort for that again, and we raced David Llewellyn, I think. Oh, sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. 1990 was it, or 89? 89, yeah. Mm -hmm. 89. Yeah, we raced David Llewellyn all the way, uh, very close to him for a good bit, and then uh, once I think the, I got a bit damper and a bit um, mm -hmm. trickier, uh, the the Toyota GT4, he was driving the works car at that time, uh, sort of, um, well, as, a, as it got wetter and more difficult, he extended his lead and we couldn't do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So we ended up second. So it was quite a good result all in all, you know. So that was the way it was. And that was our first proper outing and first proper rally together, you know. Mm -hmm. Three days of Donegal. Test anybody, I can tell you. Yeah. And like, how was that for you, like, your home rally was one of the icons of Irish rally and even then, you know. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to put that in the perspective, Kevin, how I came about. Like, if You'd almost say you'd almost be in the second division yourself, you know. And I don't mean that being mm -hmm. disrespectful to any of the drivers that I'd been with previous to that. Yes. But it was like getting the nod for the first team, you know, to come on and get to get on board with the mm -hmm. and the Tough Mac team and Sydney and so on. And you know, uh, my attitude when I got there was uh, it's like everything else. You have to be careful what you wish for. Okay. But uh, you know, when finally you got the opportunity, then of course, oh, I got this. What do we do now? <laughs> so you had to perform, like. Yes. So. I remember distinctly when I got the nod. I remember having a good chat with myself about this. And I really got my head down, concentrated a thousand percent on my own job and what it was that I had to do, mm -hmm. irrespective of anything that went on around me. Yes. So I go to the rallies and do the schedules, help with the, you know, with the work of Sydney and so on in terms of well, the service schedule, when we traveled, all that type of thing. But mm -hmm. the code driver's real job is when, the, when it's three, two, one, go. Uh -huh. That's really when you come in. And that part of the job, I put a million percent into and mm -hmm. did my very best. And obviously, we had to adapt, first of all, you know. Bertie had been used to Austin. He had been Austin Fraser. I'd been Bertie's co-driver for a long number of years. And Austin was an incredible co-driver, you know, incredible experience and brought mm -hmm. so much to the team. And then suddenly, I replaced Austin and I was a rookie co-driver. Yes. So, like I say, my attitude and my approach was to work as hard as I could on my own side, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I was more determined than ever to prove myself. And obviously it takes a wee while to jail with your driver. It doesn't matter who your driver is, mm -hmm. it's a wee while to jail. But we did that very quickly and we very quickly got into the groove. Mm -hmm. And I suppose really uh, the results speak for themselves and uh, we went on from strength to strength. Yeah. 
I think no, it's so never many years together. No, they can never lost and retired at the end of eighty nine. Like, was it an automatic shoe in, or was there like a, a selection process then before you got confirmed? Well, I don't remember the selection process. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. I remember it was. Um, I had just got married anyway that year eighty nine, and um, Paul always says to me once. Um, I got married to her, all the luck chains. <laughs> Starting at all these proper runs and all. So she takes full credit for that. <laughs> but it was very, it was, um, I, I, there was no selection process. I already rang up, how are we fix? We're going to do this. We'd previously done the rally, so all that was already done, you know? Yes. So it was a matter of jumping in there and hitting the ground running. And our first rally in 1990, it seems an eternity to be talking about 1990. Mm-hmm. Our first proper rally was 1990. Again, on the M3 was the Galway Rally, okay. which we led, but that was Austin McHale's first year in the X Division BMW. Mm-hmm. So we had the advantage of having had the car for a year previous to that. Mm-hmm. And Austin was his first event, was Galway. And of course, we led right away, or, or we got into the lead right away, doing very well. Again, I always say about Galway, typical Galway Rally, winter rally, every condition been thrown at you. Uh, it's a fantastic challenge. I love the Galway Rally, one of my favourites. Mm-hmm. And... We got on the lead and we're going really well, but there's torrential rain and we ended up sliding off the road into a field somewhere and we dropped 30 seconds getting back out or something. Uh-huh. And Austin got on the lead, but we never could get enough back then. <laughs> and, and then the bat or the alternator gave up and we had to get a jump, I had to get a battery. And then a battery from a farmer and also a set of jump leads. Okay. So we could use the battery and the jump leads to fire the car up <laughs> to drive out of the stage. Yes. So mm-hmm. we got that, but we had lost a bag of time and uh-huh. we're never going to get that back from yeah. Austin McHale, no way. Yes. So we uh, ended up second in the rally and that was our first, that was the first full-time rally, if you like, when I was yes. on full-time. Like. Uh-huh. Yes. And, you know, you often speak about, you know, the professional approach that Bertie brought to life and rally and never. Can you, can you explain that to us and how you, you know, how you conduct it and well, <clears throat> in terms of um, like the rallies for us didn't just begin on the Friday or on the Saturday morning. Like uh-huh. the rallies for us began three weeks or a month beforehand. The preparation and what had to be done and what the route was, what stages were going to be used, and you know all of that was done in those. And that and you know when you when you're that far back, Kevin, from the event, there's so much you can do and so much preparation, and all of that's done. And I feel like nothing was left to chance. Like. Everything's mm-hmm. considered and weighed up and thought about, and we'll do this and we'll do that. Even the recce, when we go to do the recce, for example, for the Circuit of Ireland way back in them days, you know, that was once you signed on for the recce, you could start and finish wherever you wanted within the route. Okay. So it was so important to pick it, figure out what was the most efficient way you could do that, how you could get the most, you know, out of your time when you were wrecking, okay. and how you planned all that out. So, like, lots of stuff like that. People say to us, many times you get over that stage, we said, oh, we did that three. Reckon hell, we only managed to get that done twice because we thought we were running out of time. But we had mm-hmm. looked at it and planned it and worked it out. And that sort of attention to detail gave them a second and on. And of course, I was like a I was like a sponge. I was absorbing all this and uh-huh. loved all of this. And um, as I said, worked really hard at it. But that was in, in rally terms, that's the way it was done. And mm-hmm. really, if you look at Bertie as a businessman, he was a revered businessman in Fermanagh or throughout Northern Ireland, throughout Ireland, the UK yeah. actually. And Bishop Engineering as a company uh, had grown into, they were, such, they were held in such high prestige that everybody wanted them. Them big jobs like Castle Court, mm-hmm. the Odyssey, I think the Waterfront in Belfast, yeah. even the Courtyard Shopping Centre here in Nettercanny were all done by Fisher Engineering. And there were there, them jobs, Fishers were getting them jobs regardless because yeah. they were the best in the business. Mm-hmm. And the reason they were the best in the business is because they, they were being led by the best businessman that you get to do it like, mm-hmm. and lots of uh, lots of the developers and and builders knew that, and they always wanted fishers involved, and I think that's the same to this very day. Yeah, like guys, they set the standard that everybody else tried to follow, basically, isn't it? You know, set the standard, and mm-hmm. no matter where you go, all them buildings are temples to fisher engineer like, and mm-hmm. you know, from the smallest farm shed at the very beginning mm-hmm. to the Odyssey in Belfast, or yeah. I think Intel in Dublin as well, you know, yeah. and they had the capacity to do that. And no mountain was too high. Like they would look yeah. at it and say, "Okay, let's do this." Like yeah. we, we can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's his attitude. Eh? Yeah, and like you know, not just in the rally car, but outside that, you had a very strong relationship as well, hadn't you? So, well, I had a very strong relationship, and I think you need to have, Kim, when you spend so much time with somebody, um, 
you need a you, you need that you can work together, do the job, and um, have the same aim and the same target and work towards that. But also away from that, we have plenty of social occasions. In fact, we have some memorable social occasions because, uh, as I'm sure all Bernie's friends know, like uh, and that I hope that they're listening to this pro- or listening to this podcast. Even Austin McHale, and James Cohn, Kieran Mack, Sydney, um, all of people that knew him really well. Bernie was a great man for singing a song and great man for a bit of old jiving and a bit of crack like that. Like mm-hmm. and so many so wedding or function we were at, he would end up up singing the song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he'd be the last man to leave. He'd be dancing half the night away, and uh, I was a, he was a star of that as well. Like, yes. and uh, I just there was always a request for him at some time to come and sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to twist his arm, did I take it? <laughs> That's right. I, yeah. I was a great family man, you know. And him, like even for all the people he employed, like I know, I know at the last count, Fishers had two hundred people employed in Fermanagh, you know, mm-hmm. the, you know, and I think. Each and every one of them people could approach Bertie, call him Bertie, uh, not Mr. Fisher, and mm-hmm. Bertie would know nearly, I would say Bertie knew every single one of them. Mm-hmm. And I'm no, chatting about the forklift drivers, mm-hmm. livery drivers, the boys mm-hmm. of the steel erectors, the whole lot. He knew them all personally, and they all knew him personally. And mm-hmm. I think in any business, you know, he had a great rapport with his staff, and uh, you know, that's what helped, that's what led to success. Like. Mm-hmm. I could say were prepared to go the extra mile to get the job done as well as, as well as he was. Yeah. So that ethos run right from the top right down through, didn't it? That, yeah. yeah. And of course they were rewarded well, you know, when were, everybody was, you know, paid well. And at the end of the year, when we come to the Christmas party, like it was full treatment, like full, mm-hmm. everything was laid on and has been for many a year. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it was a special, a, a special night. Yeah. And like Bertie, like, yes, he liked competing in rallies, but he also was like, somewhat of an ambassador for Irish Rally, wasn't he? Like, you know, we think of like 86 after his break dramas in Galway, the way he came back and, you know, was one of the boys at the forefront of safety, done the safety officer in Donegal that year and was always striving to make things better in Irish Rally, wasn't he? Yeah, you could say that, right? Because, you know, that when he came back in 86, don't forget the reason he, the reason he retired previous to that or prior to that was because of that incident was well documented in Galway mm-hmm. where he lost the brakes and went down the escape road. Yeah. And if anybody or in normal circumstances, that escape road would have been, you know, would have been five Lame, you know, people, yeah. spectators standing there watching. It was a miracle there was nobody there. And it was a miracle he avoided everybody mm-hmm. and managed to bring the car to a stop without any incident. Like, yeah. absolute miracle. Like, but anyway, um, he retired from rallying because of that. And he did that safety officer for Donegal that year. I think Matt Doherty was the clerk of the course. Mm-hmm. And... I think it was that one of the first events back. After yeah, that's right, crisis. after the whole insurance crisis. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the reason that it had to be squeaky clean. So Matt, he recruited Bertie or went to Bertie and said, look, we need somebody to do this. So Bertie and Austin Fraser gave up their time to come along and do safety officers and set the standard for the stages and so on. Mm-hmm. Did that and um, the rally ran perfect. And yeah. uh, uh, two things happened there. Number one, at, at it, reignite, it triggered the rallies again in Ireland. They could be run and run in a safe manner. The standard was set. Mm-hmm. More importantly, personally speaking, for me, and anyway, I I'd rekindled Bertie as well to come back and do uh-huh. a few rallies. Yes. So he came, so he came back in 87, he won Donegal. That's right, yeah. Mm-hmm. If I remember right. Yeah. And of course then, he really got the got the bug for it again. Mm-hmm. And he started to compete in 87, 88, and I got involved then. Mm-hmm. So maybe without that, yeah. without, if that hadn't happened, Doing that safety officer might never come back. No, you know? but even you know, like you can think of RPM, like all the different events, and you know, if he was ever interviewed, you listened because you know whatever he said mattered. You know, it wasn't just a, a flippant remark or whatever. It was always thought out. It was to the point. You know, if he mentioned there was an issue with something, it was because there was an issue, wasn't it? You know, that he was, it yeah. it was very strong and safety and making sure everything yes. was done properly. It was it was very good in, in, in assess something assessing a situation, you know, mm-hmm. and giving an opinion. Like and as you rightly say, people went, Oh, very good. That's never thought of that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and even I remember going to press conferences for different rallies and all the press would be gathered and they'll be, you know, for these major rallies or on circuit or Donegal or wherever we were. And I'd be there with Bertie and we'd be getting organized and he would look around and say, Okay, Bertie, if you expect you could win this rally and he said, Of course I expect I could win it. But he said We've got Austin McHale, we've got David Lowell, you've got Colin McRae, you've got Russell Brooks, you've James Cullen, you've gone to and so on. And he could assess each and every one of their performance and give a very honest 
uh, non bullshit answer. Like, mm -hmm. and, you know, because of that, people like to like to engage with him and, and ask for his opinion on various things. Should mm -hmm. be rallying business or, or otherwise. Like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, you have often said that the, them years you spent with Verde led to you, allowing you to travel the world, you know, being a co driver up. Yeah. Well, that was the initial, you know, yeah. step up that you needed. Absolutely, Kevin. And I, well, don't forget now, he and, he and I were together for, we rallied from, well, we began in 85 and 89, mm -hmm. and then full time from 90 onwards, like, mm -hmm. and only missed one rally in that whole time. And, and that was because I was away on holiday in Austin Fraser. I'd mm -hmm. like to come back and go on a four wheel drive Subaru. Yes. So it all worked out very well. But anyway, we rallied together during all that time. And like when you're sitting beside someone like Verdi, I'll tell you one thing, if you didn't learn or pick up something, there was something wrong with you. Like, mm -hmm. So, I have a lot to be grateful for, Kevin. My entire rally career is defined by the Fisher years. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, that's absolutely true. And you learn to you learn to co-drive. You learn to be well. You learn to co-drive at that level. You learn to work with the big teams. You learn to well, when you had a top driver like that. You learned how to cope in the situation, the speed. You learned how to win. Mm -hmm. You learned how to be um, modest and winning. And you know, you learned all about them sort of things. Like mm -hmm. so. Whenever the whenever the unfortunate day came when, after the accident in 2001, and then there was no rallies at all in 2001, it was almost remarkable, wasn't it? Like, mm -hmm. you know, the Fisher accident was in, in January, yeah. and there was virtually no rallies in Ireland for the entire year. Like, yeah. It was almost like a year of mourning, so to speak. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. But when 02 came and a couple of opportunities came around for me to go on, that was great. I got the opportunities to go on, and I always felt, I carried the Fisher name with me, you know, mm -hmm. and everywhere I went, and I still get it. People talk about Bertie, like yeah. when, when Ali and me, in more recent times, mm -hmm. when Ali Fisher and me were rallying, many people used to speak about Bertie to both of us, you know. Yes. It's always refreshing. I always, I, I always have a great time to talk to people about that, of course. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was a brilliant time, but I learned so much, Kevin. Put me in a position or a platform where I was involved with all the teams, you know, all the teams in the UK, Pirelli. Shell, all these people who are sponsors and were were influential and making opportunities happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was in the right, um, you know, mixing the right people. Yeah. Obviously, I proved it could do the job. So mm -hmm. it gave me the opportunity to go on. And I always felt I had a good lot to offer, having coming through, if you like, the school of uh, of um, <laughs> 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 yes. mm -hmm. And like you know, it was touched on there, like you know, Bertie the family man. Like you sat with Mark a few times as well. Like he was destined for greater things as well, wasn't he? Like Bertie yeah, took so sure. much pride in that as well. For sure, right. Eh? Well, there's two or three sides. Two or three sides to Mark. First of all, he's a chip of the block with Bertie, like mm -hmm. absolutely determined, and uh, as, as, which is very appropriate to say, steely determination. <laughs> and these wise, like uh -huh. excuse the pun, but Mark had the same determination, the same outlook, and the same applied in business. He was equally committed, like mm -hmm. which is great, and. As I understood back in the day, obviously, uh, Mike Mark was going to take over Fisher Engineering, as I understood it, and was going to continue on it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that wasn't to be, of course. But um, Mark was a great fellow. I was very, very good friends with Mark. And in fact, I sat on with him in a couple of rallies, three or four. We did Rally GB twice. Mm -hmm. um, we did quite a lot of other rallies. Mm -hmm. And he was oh, a deadly driver and the best at crack. Eh? We mm -hmm. used to have some crack on our way. Eh? But he was a great fellow. Uh, great driver, great in business, and then he said, "I was doing a few rallies in them days, and he sat home with me in a rally." Okay. So um, great old crack and great, uh -huh. yeah. and destined for destined for, yeah. you know, for greater things. But unfortunately, it wasn't to be. No. You know, and it's tragic, really, when you think about it. That's for sure. But he never got to fulfil that potential, or no, that never came to pass. Like you know, mm -hmm. he had begun to prove himself even at the high, you know what. Yes. Highest level, Ham and Gordy were. Mm -hmm. We we were on the crop list that year, Stephen Finley and me, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Mark and Gordon were there. They got the prize drive of the Peugeot two hundred six. That's right. Yeah. We're all mm -hmm. there together, and then we had Rally GB at the end of the year, and we're all there together. As, you know, mm -hmm. fantastic memories, and um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't uncommon for Mark to come up on a Saturday afternoon to come up with me and him and Brian Kelly away in the quads, you know, and stuff. Right. Like yes. So, mm -hmm. Lots of stuff like that. Like it was, yeah. it was a great for us. Tragic mm -hmm. like he was not here. Yeah. So, I suppose to start to wrap up, like you look back and you, Bertie Fisher, there was the man and there was Bertie Fisher, the rally driver. What's your abiding memories of them two? Well, you know, I have millions of memories of Bertie, uh, Kevin, and 
in some fantastic situations. And mm-hmm. like I say, even back to up on the stage singing an old song at a wedding or a, yes. an old party we're having, like, mm-hmm. and they're invaluable or, you know, treasured memories that I'll never forget, like, yes. you know. But in terms of, in rally terms, right, people often ask me, you know, what was your best rally? Did you ever did a very official? Well, I was, I, um, you know, everybody's asked. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure everybody's fed up with me telling them the rally was 1990 Manx Rally BMW M3. Mm-hmm. We didn't win the rally. We should have freaking won it. We yeah. beat ourselves and end up, if you like, we end up second. Mm-hmm. That was the most unbelievable rally and the most unbelievable amount of effort went into that rally. Yes. And we, we, we just lost it at the last, you know, mm-hmm. at the last hurdle. And it was devastating blow to do that after so much work. In fact, I'm a long time in the go. I almost had a tear in my eye at the end of the rally. I have not won it, you know, after the amount of work and effort that went into that event. Like, mm-hmm. And I'm speaking for both of us because Bertie was the same. Like, yes. it was such an effort and mm-hmm. it just didn't happen for whatever yeah. reason at the last minute. Like, yeah. So, you know, from a sporting point of view, that was the that was the Biden memory of, of committed mm-hmm. and going as hard as we could and putting everything on the line, you know, in 11 tenths uh-huh. and racing Brooks McRae, James Collin, and Gwendaff as well. Uh-huh. You know? And there's a there's a video of that M3. It always yeah. keeps coming up. There's you mm-hmm. know Fisher and M3 and Isle of Man and yeah. every time you look at the hair stand up on me and I can almost <laughs> remember every corner like you know. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. talked there earlier about you know Bertie, like, you know you, how to win and how to do this. You know you also learned how to lose because like the dignity that Bertie spoke with you know in front of the cameras after that, like it could have threw a stroke or whatever. He didn't. He just yeah. accepted it, didn't he? You know. So. Yeah, it's very magnificent, magnanimous, and. You know, in fairness, he was he was always great and giving praise to somebody who had achieved something. Mm-hmm. And when we won as well, he was always very modest yeah. and didn't go around, you know, stepping around the place saying that, you know, we're yeah. unbeatable or any of that. Like, yeah. there's rallying's about on the day. And as you know, and if Austin McHale was sitting here today, or if Bertie Fisher was sitting here today, he would say the toughest opponent ever he had in rallying was Austin McHale. Mm-hmm. And that is true. And I'm sure Boston's listening to this yeah. or watching this. He'll agree with that. And I would say, if the truth be known, Austin would say the same thing. Oh, he, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what he said I can, was... I can, definitely say, I can mm-hmm. definitely say that on behalf of Bertie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, like Bert and Austin McHale, like it was like mm-hmm. hammer and tongs. Yeah. And the chances are, if we, if, if we didn't win, Austin won. Yeah. If Austin didn't win, we won. Mm-hmm. You know, it was either or. Mm-hmm. During the 90s, in a way, it was an incredible era. And like Bert was at himself, like, and he was... Yeah. No, and Austin was at himself, and it was just an incredible era, and I mm-hmm. remember it so fondly. And and like I know chatting to Austin there last week, he says like no matter what happened, you know, on the stages, yes, every second counted, and you know you would do nothing to gain an extra second here or there, but step out of the car, you shook hands, you went for a beer, whatever. Like it was, right. it was left on the stages. It was there was no, you know. But yeah. you know, it was no talking behind the back, so it was all done, it was all done on the stages, wasn't it? You know, so. Yeah, but it, was, it wasn't uncommon. Mm-hmm. Um, after the circuit of Ireland or, or some of them, they were all major rallies at the time. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. all three and four day rallies, maybe maybe longer in some cases. Like, it wasn't unusual or uncommon for somebody to arrive at Bertie's office with two bottles of champagne, like the Tuesday or Wednesday after the rally uh-huh. from Austin McHale, like, right? You know. That wasn't unusual, and yes. that happened, and that, mm-hmm. I got them as well. Now it happened yes. on more than one occasion, like mm-hmm. you know. So it says a lot about the man, and yeah, and I have great admiration for Austin. And as a sportsman, he was dogged. He was hard to beat, and uh, in fairness to him, it was very fair. And mm-hmm. we fought hammer and nail I, many a time. <laughs> <laughs> Some great memories of that as well. I, we're just wrapping up now. We'll go back to Bertie again. Like you know, just what a man. Like he, what he brought to Irish Allen. From like the early seventies right through to his untimely death, like he, he raised the bar and kept it up and took it higher than even through right. the years. Well, it should be remembered too, Kevin, that Bertie has been rallying since goodness knows what age. He started mm-hmm. off as a co-driver, like yeah, and he he was um he started off a co-driver, and he went up the ranks. He drove a Mini, he drove the Mark Ones, he drove the Mark Twos, and mm-hmm. he came right up through. You know, yes. and, like he really served a hard apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. And if you look at all them old photographs, you see an odd broken headlight and <laughs> an odd yoke rolled. And yeah. you no, know, he really came up through the ranks. Like, but the one thing about him was when he got a bit, when he when he knew how to win, he knew you had to have the best equipment. Like, and he never compromised on that. Like, mm-hmm. and if you like, he single handedly 
brought the best cars to Ireland from ProDrive and RED and mm -hmm. Ford and, uh, uh, and Subaru. Like, I mean, we've had the best cars and uh, he never compromised once. He knew if you wanted to win and beat the likes of Austin McKeel, mm -hmm. you had to have the best machinery you could get. Like, mm -hmm. So he raised the bar in terms of the cars and even the organizers around him. He used to assist you know, in different things, the organization of rallies mm -hmm. that helped the rallies even get better and get bigger, you know. Yes. And, you know, a, the car, after the season, when, say, for example, the BMW, at the end of that season, that car went up for sale. Like, everybody wanted it, like, yes, because they because knew it was the Fisher car. car. Mm -hmm. They knew it had the proper spec. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they knew that what they paid for, they would get, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And that was the same for most of his cars. But where they raised the bar, like, and everybody else, wanted to compete had to follow mm -hmm. you know and that's what led to the culture in ireland of all the good cars and Subarus and everything that mm -hmm. came in years to come because all the links were made really with sydney and verde and os yeah. mchale mm -hmm. and the top drivers back in the day like, yeah. you know i've heard it was the one of the forefathers of you know what pro drive look at you know you look from you know 91 right through so even the last couple of years Subarus were still won in rallies in ireland and that all goes back to the Kenny McKinstry, yes, but Bertie Fisher was the, right, the, you know, the first guys to bring them cars into the country here. You know? mm -hmm. shouldn't, I shouldn't forget uh, about Kenny either. Like Kenny, was, um, Kenny and Bertie had some great battles as well. Mm -hmm. Tony Gall and circuits and all sorts. Like, yeah. And I, he's the godfather of motorsport in Ireland. We always say, like, King yes. Kenny. <laughs> you know, the tragedy of it all, Kevin, is that they're not here anymore. Like, no. And, you know, and I think back and everything that contributed and and uh, think of all the goodness that they brought to the rallies and and all the joy that we shared as well you know yeah and i think of mark as well you know running around that hat on him and and him the freaking smirk on him and the carry on of him you mm -hmm. know and of course not to forget emma who's a lovely girl i am mm -hmm. such, like a, the world was or, or the world was her oyster like and she had so much to offer and her charitable work and so on and Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a tragedy, really. Like it's yeah. twenty years this week, and you know, for me, when I think back on it, you know, it's it's just it, it feels no time ago since I got that phone call. Like yes, you know, and you know, all the people who were involved, and Jerry McGarty, and all the people, you know, and Fermana, and mm -hmm. the loss that has created, and Fisher Engineering, and it's, it's a tra it's a tragedy, really, yes. like, absolute tragedy. Mm -hmm. So, Rory, I think we'll wrap it up at that. So, thank you very much for taking the time for joining us. You're welcome, Kevin. I'm always delighted to talk about the Fishers and the yeah. Tough Mac team and mm -hmm. all the carry on that went along with it because we had plenty of reason to celebrate too, you know, because absolutely and Rory had a great life and and uh, tragically cut short, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. when he was here, he certainly made a count. Yeah, I like 20 Tarmac ones for Tarmac Championships. You know, it's, yeah. it speaks volumes, doesn't it? You know, it speaks volumes. And, and Mark coming on his coattails, and yes. goodness knows what mm -hmm. he would have had to offer. Like. Uh, what we've been talking about today. <laughs> okay. Know. You take care, everyone. Yeah. Chat to you soon. Cheers, Kevin. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Bye bye. And so, for the second Easter in succession, Bertie Fisher and Rory Kennedy are heading for the champagne in Bangor. But this time, they are certain of victory. And they go, and they go. Get it up. And they go, and they go. Certain, yeah. did I say? You're never certain about anything in rallying until you roll under the victory arch. But this time it's okay. Three Circuit of Ireland victories, 20 tarmac wins. The statistics are accelerating again for the Fermanagh man. And he and Rory now have an eight-point lead in the Yahoo! Toshiba series. Time for celebration. Yahoo! <laughs> Bertie Fisher and Andrew Nesbitt have made the 1999 event a classic, as we have already said. Never has so much been provided for so many by so few. It's been a good event and it's been a tough event and it hasn't been easy to win. And uh, fair credit to Andrew Nesbitt, he really gave us a very, very hard fight. At one time I thought maybe we weren't going to come out on the right side of it, but uh, we, we went out this morning and we got a very, very good time on the opening stage. Andrew had a problem and that really sort of decided the day, I think, you know. That was Dave Campion, Alistair Fisher, Rory Candy, and myself, Kevin Dunning, Token Rally. I just want to pay tribute to everyone that helped me over the last couple of months. It has been a real journey of discovery for me, and the stories I've heard have been fascinating, and I've just been overjoyed 
that every contributor to allow me to bring these stories to you. I hope you enjoyed them as much as I enjoyed recording them. So if you can like and share the podcast on all social media platforms, and if you're listening on Apple Podcast, if you could rate the podcast, it would be gratefully appreciated. Until the next time, take care. See you soon. Bye.